So it is my pleasure now to um, continue with our um, tradition of um, a hearing and engaging with the community members. And um, this is a short me message um, from Zef. Thank you for playing video. It's a Titan on, and we need your help. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Zef. I'm 11 years of age and live in Yarraboba, Queensland. I was diagnosed nine years ago at the age of two and love being a proud JDRF advocate. I've catch up with my local MPs many times to tell them how important it is that they fund the clinical research network. I've even been to Parliament House to advocate. I wear an insulin pump as well as a continuous glucose monitor. It is a part of me. It doesn't define me, but it makes it so much easier to play soccer and just be a super active kid. I know my mum really appreciates it too. In conclusion, to all the researchers in the room, please keep working hard because your researching has meant that I have the best technology to manage my type 1 diabetes. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm sure that we're all going to see this young man somewhere important in about 10 years time because he's uh, undoubtedly a very, very bright and uh, brave young person. Um, it gives me also a great pleasure now to introduce the, um, the chair of our last uh, presentation session. Um, Dr. Mary Abram, who is a senior research fellow at, um, at the technology research team lead in the Rio Tinto um, Children's, uh, Children's Diabetes Center in the Telethon Kids Institute. She is a clinician, she is a researcher, um, a very strong research interest in the field of hypoglycemia and type 1 diabetes. Um, her research and involvement in uh, insulin pump therapy and a glucose continuous monitoring is really quite exceptional. So Mary, can you come and help us to chair the next session? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you, Dorota. And I can't definitely match the enthusiasm of that little boy, but um, he has definitely set the stage for what the topic is for today afternoon. And essentially, after the buzzwords of um, cure, remission, immunomodulation, beta cell regeneration, we are coming back to something which I now see as clearly band-aid therapy or management for our type 1 um, children and adults. Um, all I can say is that these band-aids are, are getting much, much better, and hopefully we can deliver this much more positively. Uh, so that's the flavor of this session, essentially to introduce advanced therapies, technologies for management of type 1 diabetes, and also to ensure that these therapies are equitably delivered to all sections of type 1 population. So on that note, I will introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Jeffrey Braithwaite, He's the founding director of the Australian Institute of Health Innovation, director of the Center for Healthcare Resilience and Implementation Science, and professor of health systems research at Macquarie University. He's a leading health services and systems researcher with an international reputation for his work investigating and contributing to systems improvement. And the title of the talk is Implementation, Adoption, and Policy in the Health System of 2030. So, Jeffrey, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Mary. So, wasn't that great science this morning? So, what I was wondering as I was experiencing all that great science is how do we get that taken up in the delivery system? And so, I can't remember whether I invented this title of this talk or I was given it. But my bit of the jigsaw puzzle is if you have a big bubble, big bubble called policy and then a big bubble called scientific research in laboratories and then there's clinical application and then there's the delivery system and the patient, I'm somewhere in the middle of all of that and my waking moments are spent thinking how do we get a better health system and how do we get adoption and take up of all this fantastic science and these new practices. 
So that's the space that I'm going to occupy. The simpler way of explaining that is I'm the warm-up person for the other people <laughs> in the session. So let me take you through um, some implementation science and adoption and take-up ideas that might be of use. So firstly, I want to acknowledge, usually, I'm not here, I'm at Macquarie University, and I just want to acknowledge the land on which Macquarie stands and the land that on which we stand, and to um, pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So I'm from the Australian Institute of Health Innovation, as uh, Mary said, and so I work in health and medical research, but amazingly, and maybe the people this morning will be amazed at this, we don't have a laboratory. We don't have a lab. In fact, our lab is the health system. It's the health systems of Australia, notice the plural, and health systems in other countries. So I spend my time thinking, how do we take up all of the great things that a trial or a, 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 a valid piece of epidemiology or, 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 a, or an experiment in a lab? How's that taken up? So we have five, uh, seven research centres, and why I give you that slide is all the words in there are not about labs and, uh, and, uh, and um, experimental research. They're all about how do you affect change in the delivery system. So here's a wave from us, our group. I'm also a partner investigator, a, 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 a PI, on the um, Rio Tinto Children's Diabetes Centre, and that's where this work gets done. That's where we've congregated a whole lot of people to think through how do we change the system? How do we affect change on clinical practice? How do we deliver better care that's coming from all of the science that's being produced? And um, the inspirational leads are Tim Jones and Liz Davis, who you know well, who are the leads of this center based in WA. So that's by way of what I'm going to talk about. Let me now give some content. So I did a PubMed search on the 19th of June. And what I saw was there is enormous amounts of research and papers in the literature. And so one question I have of you is, how come you're listening to me because you're behind in your reading today? So who can keep pace with that? Who can deal with even the science that we heard explained to us in the last day and a half, let alone all the stuff there in the literature? So just, you can have a copy of the slides, just for uh, a snapshot, I took a, uh, a, a word cloud of what the literature says. And it's all about diabetes, obviously, this is type 1 diabetes literature, but it's about medicine and universities and studies and research and type 1 and results. That's a snapshot of what all the literature, 100,000 papers said. So I also looked at the fact that this literature has been going on for ages. So the tradition here of research is absolutely amazing. People have do, been doing work for decades leading up to the fantastic results we heard in the last day and a half, and especially I heard this morning. So there's papers galore. So the question is, how do we translate all of this? How do we get all this into practice? That's what I want to focus on for a few moments. Before I do, I noticed a paper that came out just a few days ago in JAMA Pediatric Open. And it suggested that there was a big rise in type 1 diabetes diagnoses patients uh, across the pandemic. Now, just talking to Liz Davis about this, I'm not sure how much in that data is noise or whether there is actually going to be a whole lot of new patients to deal with. But either way, I think there's huge challenges ahead of us. So, I'm going to talk about two specific things for the next few minutes. One is implementation science, and the second one is, what's the health system 
possibly going to look like if we get it right by 2030? And then what do we have to do now to get take up of all that science into practice to create a better health system in 2030? So those are the two things I'm going to do in the next few minutes. So in terms of implementation science, here's what I think the problem is. It takes on average 17 years for only 14% of new discoveries to enter practice. Considering there's 36 million papers in PubMed, that is a huge challenge for us doing more and more science and this being the result. Three other numbers I'd give you, 60% of care on average is in line with level one evidence or consensus-based guidelines. 30% of care is estimated to be waste of some kind. Test results that don't get seen, unnecessary care, bureaucratic costs that don't translate into better care. There's a whole lot of ways you can, in a complex system, that you can waste money. And 10% of patients are harmed. Most of it's itty-bitty harm that isn't going to be really harmful, but some is very harmful. So those are three headline numbers, but if you add those three headline numbers, to the fact that it takes 17 years for only 14% of all research to get into practice, then that's a big problem. That's a big problem for the people who came before lunch and said they were doing this really, really important cool science. So um, one observation is how much of um, type 1 diabetes care is reflected in those three numbers, because that's based on big epidemiological studies, which we've done and been done in the US and the UK, saying on average this is what care looks like. 60% in line with level one evidence or consensus based guidelines, 30% waste, 10% harm. To what extent does that reflect type one diabetes care in Australia and elsewhere? We don't know the answer to that, or I don't, maybe you do. So what about the solutions to that problem that I'm posing? Well, usually it's expressed in a pipeline like this. I'm going to do more research, get it into practice somehow through a pipeline. And you've seen a million models like this in your time, have you not? The problem is the pipeline is really an idealization. And healthcare is much more complex than that. Or else we would have just put the science through the pipeline into clinical practice. And that's clearly not the case. It's clearly not the case that we've done that. So there's lots of blockages and fractures. And we end up with research failure. Not clinical practice failure so much as research failure. The research doesn't get into practice. So we need better translational research. And someone this morning said, what I've, someone on the stage here said, what I've realized is we are a community coming to this meeting. That really encouraged me. This is a fantastic community with different perspectives on how we can improve care for kids with type 1 diabetes. So we've done a lot of research outside of uh, type 1 diabetes, thinking about this and building coalitions of researchers and clinicians on the ground and implementation scientists like me to try and improve care. So here's an example. This is an example from cancer. We formed up in 2012 a group of people to get more evidence into practice in cancer in eastern Sydney. So that was what the net network looked like in 2012. The circles are people the lines between them are connections between the people where they work together. That's what it looked like in 2013. That's what it looked like in 2015. That's what it looked like in 2017. And that's what it looked like in 2021. So what we've got is now a flourishing network of researchers and people like me who do research on how to get evidence into practice with the clinicians trying to deliver care and the researchers in the labs and the researchers doing the science. I think that's a very strong model for the kind of work we do, and it's reflected in our center. Here's another one. I'm the implementation science lead for Australian genomics. So this is what it looked like when we got a big grant in 2016, and that's what it looked like by 2018. So I wonder what the network map looks like across Australia for type 1 diabetes, all the people who are working from different perspectives in this community. So implementation science is creating a science of achieving change and getting more evidence into practice. And there's lots of examples. And I'm not going to go through all of these for fear of outstaying my welcome. Although, Chair, I do think you gave me, was it 200 minutes? <laughs> so there's lots and lots of examples. Now, I'm as good on Google Images as you are. And there's lots and lots of models 
for how to get evidence into practice and how to do the science of implementation. But I wonder if we should spend more time thinking about that. Well, here's a couple of models that we use, that we designed in our research institute. One is being really good at preparing for change and thinking about the capacity for the system to actually implement the new thing that's been developed. And then what's the type of implementation we're seeking? Are we trying to change clinical behavior on the front lines? Uh, or what are we trying to do? What about resources and leverage? We are assuming when we do science that there's gonna be take up on the front lines of care. Well, let me tell you, the front lines of care is not receptive necessarily to all the science that's being produced. In fact, there's a case to be said for the front lines not to be receptive for anything other than hanging on by the skin of their teeth, delivering care as best they can. So I wonder if we can tip all this science into a system that's struggling. That's a very salient question for us in the work we're doing here. And then you've got to take it to scale, and we've got models for that too, about radiating out what we know to be taken up right across a whole health system, instead of just in a center of excellence. So these are the sort of questions. Now, the other bit of this title of this session is adoption, and I've prepared some slides, but I'm not gonna talk about them. I'm gonna leave them with you. You can have a copy of those slides. But adoption is a whole other area where we've published a lot of work taking uh, a stance that says, how do we get people to adopt all this science? Is it a push model, by the way, where we're pushing the science into the system, hoping it will take it up? Or is the system, the delivery system, wanting this and pulling it in? I think it's a push model. And that's not the best way for us to put science into a system. I think we really have to think that through. And that's what we're trying to do in our center. Correct, Tim? <laughs> Correct, Liz? That was just a test to make sure you were listening. <laughs> and you passed the test, Tim and Liz. Excellent. So I've got some slides on that. I'm going to leave it with you. There's a whole lot of stuff on adoption, the degree of uptake of ideas, behaviors, practices, the way the organizations that we have delivering care are primed and have the capacity to take up what we're trying to have them take up. These are really crucial questions for us. And we probably don't answer, we'll ask them enough or find answers for them. So that's all I want to say about that. I'm going to slip through. and I'm going to talk about one other thing, the future of healthcare. The other thing that we spend a lot of our time doing in my institute is thinking through what is it that we want to land on? What's the health system look like by 2030? What's it going to look like? Now, luckily, there's a whole book on this that I edited with a whole lot of people across the world. And you can buy it or you can read the summary in this journal, but don't tell the publisher <laughs> that uh, there's a summary in a journal. Am I being filmed? <laughs> this is career limiting, I'm sure. So there are 148 authors covering 152 countries in this big, it's a big doorstopper kind of book. And what we ask those uh, researchers, uh, policymakers, all sorts of people across 152 countries is, what's the healthcare system gonna look like in the future, essentially? It's a big doorstopper book. I'm gonna summarize it in a couple of slides. What lessons can be taken from this big wisdom of crowds, whole bunch of people thinking like futurologists about where the health system's gonna land by 2030? All the colored countries are in the book, and the gray ones, we couldn't get to, the, get to them by the time we went to publication. These are the things that they said. There are five trends running through modern health systems. Trying to create health systems that are sustainable, harnessing genomics, harnessing emerging technologies, trying to deal with global demographic dynamics, which are changing, especially aging populations and chronic and complex diseases, and developing new models of care to deliver care to patients. Now those are happening now, and we couldn't stop those if we wanted to. They're gonna happen across the 2020s into 2030. But they also said there were nine things that people were working on, nine, if you like, initiatives that health systems were working on to try and create the health system of the future. Integrating services because patients fall through the cracks or they're not very well joined up. That's especially the case in Australia. Fine, how do we pay for it all? How do we become more patient-based, more patient-focused? 
How do we deliver universal care? We say we have a universal health system in Australia. No, we don't. Um, uh, technology and information technology. How do we harness all the new IT, all the new diagnostics? How do we deal with aging populations? To our shame, we had a royal commission. We had to have a royal commission to tell us that we needed to look after aging patients better. How do we do preventative care better than we do now? How do we do all this with good policy and accreditation and standards? And how do we have a workforce of the future? Now, all of this is a question. How do we get to this version of 2030? And how do you, with your work, help us to get a better health system by 2030? Rather than us being unduly focused on just the problems in the here and now. So here's a snapshot. I will leave you with these slides. And essentially what it says is, we need to get from a more fragmented and siloed system to a more joined up system. We need to get from a system based on volume of patients to providing value to patients. We need to be less provider oriented and more consumer or patient oriented and so on and so forth. You can take a picture or I can send you these slides or you can send me an email and I'll give you a copy. So I think those are the two things I'm trying to figure out in our center and in my work that might be helpful to some of you, which is how do we do the implementation science bit better? And how do we think of the health system we're trying to create by 2030? I hope you agree. These are useful questions for us to ponder. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Jeffrey, for that insightful talk and for sort of, for most of us who are not very familiar with implementation science, it provided an overview of what the whole picture would be and the roadmap to a sustainable healthcare system at least till 2030. Now, I do also have to briefly remind you that all the questions from the speakers can be um, addressed to them when they're back during the panel session. So we will continue with the talks for now. Um, the second speaker for today is Professor Mark Cooper, and Professor Mark Cooper is the head of diabetes department in the Central Clinical School at Monash University. He was formerly the chief scientific officer of Parker Head Heart and Diabetes Institute, as well as the director of Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation Center for Diabetes Complications, and maintains an active clinical practice at the Alfred as a senior endocrinologist. Well, that didn't match the bio. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes. I think I'd prefer to be Sybil McCauley, actually. But hopefully we'll, we will have more contact in the next few months now that Sybil is going to find our part of Melbourne as well an interesting place to work at. So, um, so I'm Mark Cooper, and while we're waiting for my slides... Um, well, I thought what I would do, first of all, it's very interesting to follow the previous talk. And, uh, oh, my slides have come in. So I've been asked to talk about adjunct treatments for type 1 diabetes. To be honest, I didn't really understand what the topic meant. <laughs> I asked a few people, including Dorota, and it turns out this is not an area of research I do, so it's very unusual for me to give a talk at a meeting where I'm going to show slides of which... I've done none of the work in the slides, or I mean people that worked with me have done the work. So, but I think it's a very interesting topic actually, and uh, I'm gonna give you my perspective. But before I do that, I just wanna emphasize, I know we've been hearing from these people with type one diabetes, and we've got people in the audience that either have type one diabetes or children with type one diabetes. And I know we mentioned some of the negative aspects, of course, but I do wanna emphasize as an adult endocrinologist, we see many people with type 1 diabetes who are coping very well with the, with the condition and particularly those that do not develop the complications have at least a normal or even a longer uh, lifespan. So I just don't want it to all be so depressing. We have made great progress in the last 30 or 40 years. The lifespan and the morbidity of type 1 diabetes has decreased and particularly in the area of complications there's been a lot of very exciting advances. There hasn't been a magic bullet. There's been incremental advances, but they've really delivered some very big breakthroughs. And the 
outlook for, for example, in diabetic kidney disease, which I've worked mostly in, we've reduced progression by more than 70 or 80%. There's still 20% to go, so it's not over, but I want to give you at least an example of great optimism in the area of type 1 diabetes. So if we look here at type 1 diabetes, obviously the main treatment for glucose control is insulin. But you will discover that there are many people taking other agents to try and optimise their diabetic control, even if it's off licence. And I know many people who are older with type 1 diabetes where the endocrinologist or the local doctor wonders if there might be a component of metabolic syndrome or obesity and they've added other agents. And you can see here, metformin is commonly used by some people with type 1 diabetes. People use DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, sometimes as part of the associated obesity that some of them will have. And there is increasing use of SGLT2 inhibitors. And indeed, an amylin analogue premolentide is actually registered for optimising glycemic control in diabetes. So although most people are on insulin alone, there are many people that will ask you questions or will consider using off-label use of glucose-lowering agents. And I think this is one of the aspects of adjunct treatment for type 1 diabetes. And these are data actually from Germany and Austria. So what about SGLT2 inhibitors? Well, indeed, the European agency has approved two SGLT inhibitors, dapagliflozin, which is the cl a classic SGLT2 inhibitor, and sotagliflozin, which is actually an SGLT1 and 2 inhibitor. I won't go through the logic for that, we can discuss it at leisure, but these are complementary treatments that are being used in people with type 1 diabetes who may be overweight, and there is evidence that they confer renal and cardiovascular protection although most of the data has been in type 2 diabetes. Subsequently, NICE has recommended that these would be very useful. And one of the biggest uses of these agents is in insulin-treated type 2 diabetic patients where they've been shown to be remarkably good at insulin sparing. The uh, companies are worried about using these agents because there is an increased risk for diabetic ketoacidosis. And unfortunately, they've now been, they're not approved. You cannot really use them in Australia, but there is off-label use, I have to admit. So there have been quite a few trials with these agents. This just gives you data from dapagliflozin, and then following that is the EASE program with empagliflozin. This was used in type 1 diabetes, and indeed, these agents do reduce haemoglobin A1c in type 1 diabetes, and they're also associated with significant weight loss and a significant reduction in the insulin dose. So they are agents that work in type 1 diabetes, and it makes sense because the mechanism of action is totally insulin independent and uh, will work no matter what form of diabetes you have. And in actual fact, if you actually look at the real world data in studying people with type 1 diabetes, and I've seen these as data that have been uh, obtained in Finland, the Finn Diane have quite a few patients that are actually taking SGLT2 inhibitors. They've reduced their insulin dose and there is an increase in diabetic ketoacidosis. So it's definitely a risk, but some people are willing to take that risk. So the concern is that there's this two to four fold increase in diabetic ketoacidosis and these are just showing you the data and there's no evidence how to really reduce ketoacidosis. This was a problem even in insulin-treated type 2 diabetes, but with training by endocrinologists, patients and doctors, that problem has decreased, but has not completely disappeared in the type 2 diabetes situation. So how could we solve this? The role of ketone monitoring is still uh, controversial in this situation. What about very low dose formulations? I'm not going to talk about them, but there are some studies with a very low dose of dapagliflozin, 1.25 milligrams, which seems to have some of the glucose benefits in type 1 diabetes, weight loss, and is not associated with ketoacidosis. So I don't think the companies are particularly interested, but this is something where the type 1 diabetes community, it would be worth them trying to further stimulate work in this area, because I think these drugs do have a role 
in type 1 diabetes, not only for the glucose side, but for the amazing end organ benefits that have actually been seen in type 2 diabetes. What about GLP-1 receptor agonists? Well, we've heard the word Ozempic, and I can't remember what the other one, Wigover, I think it's called. People are talking about these drugs all the time. And now there are dual receptor agonists and triple receptor agonists coming. So these are going to be used very widely in the area of obesity and probably in type 2 diabetes. Now, in most people with type 1 diabetes, the intellotropic effect of the GLP-1 receptor agonists are not thought to be particularly relevant. But there are some concepts of the way they work where they might be relevant in type 1 diabetes. They might be useful in those people that still have residual insulin secretion. And this may actually end up being more and more of an issue in type 1 diabetes as some of the other therapies become introduced, which might make people less reliant on insulin or at least insulin sparing situations. And we believe that they also have end organ protective effects. Indeed, we know that they're very good as anti-atherosclerotic agents and potentially they also may have benefits in the kidney. So these just show you some trials that have been done more than five years ago using GLP-1 receptor agonists in um, type 1 diabetes. And you can see here that there is a reduction in haemoglobin A1c and a reduction in the insulin dose. So there's no question that they will achieve benefits on glucose control, even in the setting of type 1 diabetes. So they are even better at reducing body weight. And as you would know, many people with type 1 diabetes on insulin do develop a significant weight gain. And maybe this would be very helpful in that context. They reduce both the basal and bolus insulin dose between 0 and 50%. And indeed, these agents are particularly good at reducing the glucose excursion after a meal. And uh, we have a nice review. I know people are advertising all their reviews at this meeting, but we have a recent review in cell metabolism where we've talked about the potential action of glucose, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists and postprandial glucose excursion. There is believed to be these will be particularly useful in those people who still are C-peptide positive. And indeed, in some people with type 1 diabetes who had preserved beta cell function, they were able to eliminate the prandial insulin dose. So there have been studies shown that unfortunately in type 1 diabetes, there is an increased risk of ketosis in using this particular um, GLP-1 receptor agonist. There are significant gastrointestinal side effects. In type 2 diabetes, up to 10% of patients find the GI side effects impossible and can't continue on them. But in general, it settles. But the um, ketosis is probably related not to a particular metabolic effect of the GLP-1 receptor agonist, but the association of significant GI side effects. What about DPP-4 inhibitors? These are relatively innocuous glucose-lowering drugs. They have an amazing side effect profile, but their effect on um, type 1 diabetes is not particularly impressive. So although these drugs don't have side effects, they're not particularly useful. That's a common phenomenon in medicine. A drug that doesn't work often doesn't have side effects. <laughs> and then we've got pramlantide, which is an amylin analogue. I worked on more than 20 years ago in this area. It is registered for type 1 diabetes. It also has significant gastrointestinal side effects. We actually did a clinical trial, I remember, at the Austin, where we gave amylin to uh, non-diabetic subjects, and many patients complained of severe nausea. This is, um, this is a drug that does work in type 1 diabetes. It's not available in Australia. And the pickup in the US has not been particularly uh, impressive. Nevertheless, we shouldn't forget Amelin because, in actual fact, Novo and other companies are considering Amelin and related agents as part of combinations for obesity. So, this may be an area that will be revisited in the future. Now, what about metformin in type 1 diabetes? Well, to be honest, the results have not been very impressive. And the meta-analysis shows that probably the reduction in glucose is less than 0.1%, and the effect on insulin requirements is also very modest. So metformin in type 1 diabetes has turned out 
not to be very popular, but it is still licensed for use in France. So if you're a French type 1 diabetic, you might take it. Now, there was the removal study. I think Australians were involved in this, and I think JDRF has supported this. So one of the possibilities that they thought was, even if it doesn't have such impressive effects on uh, metabolism, maybe it'll have an effect on cardiovascular disease, because there had been some data from the UK PDS in type 2 diabetes that these agents might be useful, and it's one of the reasons metformin remains the mainstay of therapy in type 2 diabetes. And so they did effects, these are the effects on uh, insulin dose and LDL cholesterol, and they're really very unimpressive. And then you can see here the effect on haemoglobin A1c is negligible, and there's the insulin dose really not very effective. And there's been a whole series of studies, including the removal study, and overall the effect is rather modest. They also did carotid IMT thickness as a surrogate for cardiovascular disease, and it turned out that it was not effective. So where are we with adjunct therapy in type 1 diabetes? These are all the glucose-lowering drugs and what we would hope they could do in the first column on the left, but ultimately the effects are rather modest, and um, at this stage only some of the drugs are available for use as adjunct therapy in type 1 diabetes. I think there is so much research going into type 2 diabetes that even if type 1 diabetes just piggybacks on that, ultimately some of these drugs, I think, will end up being of value to type 1 diabetes, either affecting glucose, weight gain, or the end organ injury that remains the major cause of morbidity and mortality in type 1 diabetes. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Mark Cooper, and that was a great overview of the adjunct therapies, and especially from a pediatric endocrinologist perspective who does not prescribe anything other than metformin and insulin. So it's completely a new field for us. So the next um, keynote speaker is whom I think we had right previously. Um, so it's Associate Professor Sybil McCauley, and Sybil is an adult endocrinologist and a researcher at St. Vincent's Hospital and the University of Melbourne. Sybil leads a research program which investigates insulin pump therapy, exercise, sleep, psychosocial well-being, and advancement of closed-loop insulin delivery systems. And hence, the present title of her talk is Improving Health with Diabetes Therapeutic Technology. Welcome, Sybil. Hello. So it was great to be impersonated by an international professor, but I'm not Mark Cooper, I'm Sybil. And um, it's lovely to see friendly faces in the audience. So I am here flying the flag for, I think it was paradigm shift number five from Professor Ruiz yesterday. So this is the advanced technology session. And I did very much appreciate the panel before lunch um, saying that, look, probably in the last decade, paradigm shift number five has punched above its weight. And I would agree with that. It's been a big decade for technology and diabetes. And I think we now in clinical care are bearing the fruits of that. We have so much more to offer. So I guess in this short snapshot today, I needed to pick a few things out of this big decade. So if we think of the whole century since insulin's first been available, the first nine decades of that, the insulin delivery and the glucose monitoring were separate. And so I've stopped these arrows 10 years ago because until that point there was incredible advances, but it was for glucose monitoring on its own and then insulin delivery on its own. And then they just started getting together um, around the time I was doing my endocrine training and we've had a lot of options to therefore push this area forward. So now, instead of the human brain having to make every decision about every insulin dose, depending where the glucose and everything else is at the time, we now have the advent of first and subsequent generation of automated delivery systems, which is fantastic. And while everyone else in this room, all the people working really hard on prevention and cure, I'm part of the crew who do our little bit to keep people healthy in the meantime. So. Just in case there's some people in this room that haven't stepped into a diabetes clinic in the past 12 months, here's a really quick snapshot of some of the terminology of technology we have available today. 
So continuous glucose monitors being a hair-like filament, a sensor that sits under the skin for usually somewhere between one to two weeks now. And the, um, the latest versions don't need finger prick calibration most of the time. Secondly, there's a pump. And the reason I put this here is just to remind ourselves that this is subcutaneous insulin delivery near continuously of rapid acting insulin analogs. And when I come to some of the slides, you'll see why I've just revisited that. So now um, there's um, sensors that can talk to pumps, pumps can de deliver manually, and there's the um, early generation automated um, systems that have the sensors and the pumps working together. So this is going to be some quick snacks. I chose a few topics for us to go through, and these are really um, areas that we've been leading from um, Melbourne and um, want to share some of these advances with you. So we're going to talk about basal delivery, we're going to talk about exercise, and then a few features of automated insulin delivery. So if we rewind to a decade ago, Bizarrely, there was this evidence gap for this um, subcutaneous basal delivery. At that point, the options were long-acting insulin injections or pumps that were starting to get information from glucose sensors to turn off. But um, the studies at that point were really looking at, so if the basal delivery was stopped on the right here, how long, um, how long does it take for the insulin levels to go down? Or on the left, it was, let's double the pump rate and see what happens. But actually, when we looked at our clinic data, most of the people had basal rates of about one unit an hour, and they were changing by about 0.2 units an hour. So we had a look at that, and in this study, we took that basal rate change, we increased it by that much, reduced it to see what happens, and lo and behold, very little happened. In fact, after reducing it, many hours um, went by and there was no change in the circulating insulin levels. When we increased it, it even then took a few hours to change. And I guess that was all being built into algorithms for the automated systems. But we needed to understand these clinical decisions we were making, adjusting basal rates in clinic, and when people were adjusting their pump safe for exercise, what was happening? And realistically, that insulin, the current insulin preparations, are hanging around for a very long time. So that brings us across to the milieu of exercise. And I guess in health, so um, the insulin secretion from the pancreas really quickly into the portal vein can change very dynamically when someone is starting to exercise to then maintain glucose homeostasis, deliver energy to the exercising muscles. But once we have subcutaneous insulin that has to make its way to the circulation and then um, it has its inherent um, delay in onset and offset, that can be really problematic when the situation is changing. So um, also with exercise, insulin requirements can vary a lot, even in the same person from day to day, it can be very unpredictable. And the big issue can be the hypo risk both during and after exercise. So um, the other thing, starting to get some understanding of what happens with anaerobic exercise and in fact glucose going up, which may need to be mitigated by more insulin. So with that in mind, we, um, we explored what will happen if we do what people were doing at the time, which was typically, and we did a survey to design this study, the advice at the point, so take yourself back many years when people were on basal, um, basal, manual basal rates, was often reduce the insulin pump, um, put a temp basal of half, 50% reduction one hour before exercise. And that was, and then hopefully you won't have much hypoglycemia. But what we actually found is when we did that, nothing much happened by, um, by one hour. It was only 5% less, and actually it took two to three hours really for that change in um, basal insulin delivery to take place. And then, um, then once people exercised, actually the insulin um, levels transiently went up, and then they went down afterwards, and people who had glucose levels less than seven going into exercise actually hypoed. And all of a sudden, there was a few parameters here to deal with. Um, soon after that, there was an excellent um, consensus statement Mark Rudell and colleagues released that has a really nice picture that incorporated work we'd done and many other studies showing that, look, glucose trends after aerobic exercise go down, after anaerobic go up, and mixed exercise can um, have glucose stability, but it can be unpredictable. And so all of a sudden, this is something for us to talk with patients about who are manually adjusting the doses, okay, so we need to start anticipating exercise by maybe um, one and a half to two hours if we're reducing the basal rate. And um, having said that, if it's an um, anaerobic session, maybe you need more insulin. 
Okay, so then we can fast forward to automated delivery. And really, it's been a game changer. So in the US in 2017 and here in Australia early 2019 is when we've had our first commercially available automated system. And again, I expect many of you will know this, but it's almost to remind ourselves what are the key components of the current commercial systems so that we know what to do when any of those break and also how to talk with people who are thinking about using these systems about all the different bits. So the absolute minimum key bits at the moment for some sort of automated delivery is a continuous glucose sensor that we talked about. At this point, these are external sitting under the skin. We need a control algorithm to be doing some calculations to determine at this point the automated basal delivery. And we need a pump which is, which is external at this point, either tubed pump or a patch pump that's going to deliver this subcutaneous insulin. Again, non-physiological, but the best current option we have. And as everyone here has been talking about these couple of days, this very much is a tech option until prevention and cure have achieved. It's a very good tech option, but it's a, it's a stopgap approach. I was going to fast forward now. Um, in um, 2017, we started this study. And this was a very, um, there were two studies, an adult study. Um, led by David O'Neill, paediatric study led by Tim Jones here, which was the first Australian study, and actually this was the first one to start in the world, which was randomised control trial, looking at the current standard of care, which at that point was insulin delivered by either injections or pump. At that point, particularly for adults, was finger prick insulin um, glucose monitoring. And if we do a randomised control parallel design trial, standard of care for six months versus the first generation of automated insulin delivery, what happens? So I guess one thing that happens is a whole lot of centres work together. So for the adult study, there were seven centres around Australia. I think for the PEED study, it was five centres. There was a lot of capacity built. There was a lot of interest. And this was funded as part of the CRM program. So we had in the adult study 120 people. And they um, had a lot of visits over the six-month period. And it was really pleasing to see the results. It was not unsurprising that there was improved time in range and less hypoglycemia. And the main time is particularly overnight. We can see with the adults here and the peds, the big difference is when there's not the challenge of meals and exercise and other things happening, and when the um, basal delivery is more predictable. So there was substantial improvement in time in range, less hypoglycemia, and then consistent with other studies that were at that point happening around the world. We then combined these, so we're looking at automated delivery and exercise, because at that point it hadn't been looked at. So this was actually beforehand, before the commercial system was available. So with a first generation system, if we announce exercise, so we change the target from at that point 6.7 to 8.3 glucose target, we do that a couple of hours before exercise. As we've seen in previous work we'd done and elsewhere, if the glucose is low, so less than seven just before exercise, let's have a um, supplementary carb load. And at that point, we could see that um, the glucose during exercise, I think some of it's disappeared on the slides, but it, it was safe. There was um, no significant hypoglycemia during exercise. It was all mitigated by that announcement, changing the pumps, having the carb load. And um, the different types of exercise, um, high intensity or moderate intensity, we'd see a different response. We also could distinguish with those two biochemically. We then also looked at resistance exercise. This was a three-way study involving um, Australia and a senator in centre in Canada as well. And we could see here that once we extend the observation overnight, people were safe. So these systems, when exercise was announced, people didn't have major hypoglycemia that wasn't easily treated. There was um, and a differentiated counter-regulatory response, sorry, depending on what type of exercise was done. So I guess here what we're looking at is if we could detect these, um, these conditions, so exercise and what type automatically, could we feed that into an automated system, give some more signals? So we're looking at adding things beyond just glucose information for the algorithm to take on board. OK, I'm now going to jump across. And I think we've had a lot of talk about paediatric studies. And um, we've done our own adult work. But until this point, actually, most of the studies had excluded older adults, literally including our own. There's this hard cut point. At, you can enrol people up the age of 60 or 70, and that's it. They can't participate. And it's not like diabetes goes away when people get older. So we have a whole lot of, and I think echoing Mark Cooper's um, 
sentiments. We have a whole lot of older adults who've lived for many decades with type 1 diabetes. And in fact, I find in clinic they can be a history lesson in themselves, telling us about what um, management they've had over the decades. And in fact, some of them are already using pumps. So what we, um, what we wanted to do was really understand that, so these, these older adults with long duration type 1 diabetes, who we know from the literature have greater um, rates of severe hypoglycemia, greater sequelae, so if they are falling, there's more chance of fracture and other issues. There's also higher rates of impaired awareness. So um, what's, how are they going to go with, um, with technology? Should they be included as well? Um, there was also at the time, many people have probably seen these widely publicised consensus recommendations. So this is where we get the time in range target, more than 70% is a general target, less than 4% time below range. But then people um, who were older, and it didn't define how old, they were picked out for quite different targets as a whole group. So really stringent um, hypo target of less than 1% time below 3.9, which I think even in clinical trials is very hard to achieve with current therapy. But at the same time, let's, um, let's be happy with the time in range target of 50%. And that's not a very high bar to aim for. And if people were healthy and um, on board with using anything for their diabetes therapy, then why, why have it such a low bar? So um, we wanted to ask the question, are these um, recommendations uniform, suitable for all older adults? And um, with funding from JDRF in the US and um, seed funding with Diabetes Australia, we undertook the Oracle study. So that was older adult closed loop study. So that was um, at two clinical sites in Melbourne. And um, what we had here was randomised crossover study looking at adults who'd had um, had their 60th birthday, that had type 1 diabetes for at least 10 years and they were already using a pump. And um, importantly to point out, this group were not frail. They could have some cognitive impairment. We um, enrolled people who were happy to with mild dementia but not moderate or severe dementia. And um, we had a good look at their clinical status in terms of frailty, functional status, so we knew who was doing the trial. And ultimately, they were a relatively fit and healthy group of older adults. And what we saw was, um, in fact, results that mirrored the younger people. So we could see here, and, um, so, and bear in mind here, the comparator is actually sensor augmented pump therapy. So unlike the um, trial with younger people, here we've got a really high bar comparator, sensors, pumps, and the only difference is the algorithm. And even with such a high bar comparator, there was more time in range, particularly overnight, less time hypo and less time, less time high, which was a really good segue to say we don't need to limit necessarily trials and certainly not clinical care um, by an upper age group. So um, older age is not necessarily a barrier and um, it's important as well as the very young children, the pregnant people, the people on dialysis, really not leaving groups behind. So then we asked them how they felt about all of this. So really trying to understand, so beyond glucose, great. There's some really um, rich evidence now showing that automated delivery improves glucose. But um, how's the experience? And bear in mind, this is a first generation system. So this was research um, using Medtronic 670G. So um, definitely people were happy. They were happy having glucose, um, glucose levels more, um, more in healthy range, less hypos, and um, particularly overnight. I think there was people touching on yesterday or actually John, the transplant recipient this morning, they're waking up in a sweat every night and feeling like a truck had hit you. So having these um, people who'd had many decades living with type 1 then all of a sudden be able to have really minimal hypoglycemia overnight I think was a game changer. Um, but what they did say was the downside this first gen system was disruptive alarms. So we had a look at that and what we could see here, so this is sleep. So people were wearing um, non-invasive sleep monitors. It's not just overnight. We confirmed people were sleeping. And um, what this shows is that firstly, there was in confirmed sleep after the first three or four hours, there definitely was better time in range in the um, intervention arm. But then we look at the alarms. And although there's much um, fewer low glucose alarms in the red, which is the intervention group, what happened actually the total alarms were much more. These alarms were a pain because they weren't low glucose, people were asleep, and really they didn't want to be waking up for that. 
So I think one of, and it's a first gen system, so they, these were very noisy systems, but one of the call to everyone with um, looking at this data was saying, we need to look at this when we're doing trials. We can't just look at glucose, we can't just look at other survey results. We need to look at things that are important for people and alarms during sleep are really important. So um, sleep itself, prioritising that in these studies. And I guess with any intervention, whether it's tech, whether it's transplantation, all of these things need to look at outcomes beyond glucose. Um, we've had a look at driving. We've got some other data um, getting ready to be prepared. So with driving, historically, when people weren't wearing CGM, people um, not wearing CGM, driving can be potentially a very risky activity. So the old guidelines used to say, check before you start, make sure you're above five, and then check every two hours. Two hours. Think how many lanes you can cross and people you can run into in two hours if someone doesn't have awareness and is not doing it well. Whereas the new guidelines, it's now very much encouraging everyone with type 1 diabetes, if they do have access to um, glucose sensing, to wear CGM during driving, have active alerts. And so this was an early study that looked at people not wearing um, real-time CGM. We had masked CGM results, and it certainly showed on the right. If people were above five when they started, then they typically stayed in a, um, in a healthy non-hypo range. But people who started low really did go low, which um, is something we want to avoid. All right, we're just about finished. So to bring it all together, this is where we're up to in 2023 in Australia. We now have three commercial systems, which is fantastic having these options to present to people. And they all are backed by really strong trial evidence. On the left, we've got the, um, the Medtronic early systems with trials that were done in Australia. In the middle, this is um, out of North America, the Control IQ tandem system, which had some um, very similar findings of improved time in range, less hypoglycemia. And this is Roman Havorka's Cambridge group, some of their early work. Now that CAM APS is um, finally available, there's a wealth of data um, trials behind that. I've made this table, not for you to get all the details, but you're most welcome to take a photo if you would like. This is for us as a clinician, having a think about what are some of the key bits when I'm talking clinic with someone who's thinking about a system? What are some of the key bits for me to think through to talk with them about for options that are available? And um, there's definitely no one size fits all. Not everyone wants to use a pump or sensors, but for people who are at this point willing to wear both, because there's two bits of hardware that need to be worn, these are the, some, of the, um, some of the different parameters. And I particularly want to point out for exercise. So if someone is um, quite insulin sensitive and is undertaking a lot of exercise, then I would say that the options in the automated mode are a big aspect to help them choose because some of them are um, less um, adjusting for exercise, such as I would say the ease off where whatever. So someone, they have personal glucose targets in CAM APS but then the ease off function is a one step up. It will increase the target by 2.5 and it doesn't necessarily tend to be enough. The Medtronic system has three targets now, 5.5, 6.1, 6.7 that people can choose between. And then there's a fixed target of 8.3 for exercise, but that does also shut off the auto corrections when they're in that mode. So these are just some of the nuances that it's worth understanding for anyone who's prescribing um, automated insulin delivery. So then what happens? So two years ago, oh sorry, at the start of um, 2019 was when this was available. So we had a look, what's, what's happening in the real world in Australia when these systems are being introduced? So this was a study um, led by Laura Donaldson, endocrine fellow, that looked at five sites, both private and public in Victoria. And so for those first two years after these systems became available, what's happening? Is the landscape in Australia similar to what we've seen in trials? Does it match our overseas experience? And it does. So what we saw is that time in range improved quickly within the first month and it stayed there for up to two years. Hypo rates were low in the people in clinic who started using these systems and stayed low. And um, HbA1c dropped by um, 0.5 percentage points. And what we can see in the top, like many of the studies, the people that got the most benefit are the people that started with the high HbA1c. So it's really reassuring to see, okay, in fact, the real world evidence locally does represent what we've seen in the trials. And just to bring it home, in case everyone's thinking it's all fixed with this technology, at the end of the day, particularly with tube pumps, this is only as good as the insulin getting through the system to the body. And so we um, 
published this set of troubleshooting guidelines as a bit of a wake up call because we had one patient who was on a commercial sensor augmenter pump and um, she was volunteering planting trees in the morning on a Sunday. She didn't have any pens with her. She could see her pump wasn't working. She tried to correct and that didn't work. So by the time she presented to a, a different hospital, tertiary emergency department, she wasn't ketotic, she was just hyperglycemic and struggling, but she managed to end up in cardiogenic shock in intensive care because they didn't work through a systematic approach to troubleshooting. So I guess it's just to remind us at the end of the day, um, patch pumps don't have the tube, um, the tube pumps do, and working through potentially a systematic approach to see what's going wrong if the insulin's not going to be there. Because no matter how sophisticated the algorithm is and how accurate the sensor is, if the insulin's not getting in, we can still get into trouble quickly. That reminds us it's just a tech option until the cure is there. That's it. So, in summary, we have talked through a few things with tech. At the moment, it is here to stay until the prevention and cure are achieved. But Brilliantly, we now have CGM subsidies for everyone with type 1 in Australia, so that gives access to the real-time glucose information, the alarms. We've now seen automated delivery really rolled out safely across the lifespan, though there are still some subgroups who need to be um, studied particularly, um, such as, for example, older adults with cognitive impairment who are needing a lot of assistance. Um, so there are still some groups who haven't been fully studied, but there's a lot of evidence out there both in trials, in the real world, and um, we've still got the challenges of this insulin being pharmaco, um, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of these preparations. At this point, the commercial systems, they're all single hormones. So these are insulin only systems. In research, there's glucagon plus insulin biohormonal systems that work a bit like the accelerator and the brake, but we don't yet have these in clinical care. And um, some of the holy grail really for the tech will be the fully closed loop for every person with all types of diabetes. So we're not there yet, we're, um, but looking for unannounced meals, unannounced exercise will be some of the next steps and looking at a whole lot of outcomes beyond glucose. And then there's the future. So there are so many things we can look at. We can look at advanced sensors, looking at other things beyond glucose, faster, smarter insulins. We um, need to look at many outcomes, particularly psychosocial, functional status, um, and other circumstances such as driving and sleep where someone's not paying as much attention to their glucose. Um, look at different populations. We need to look at advancing the tech itself. So um, more work with patchless pumps, interfaces that accommodate someone who's got sensory impairment, um, little people, big people, um, and having implantable long-term glucose sensors will be a new game changer because at the moment where these sensors are external, someone's running a marathon, they sweat off, someone might be wearing a slinky cocktail dress, these pumps and sensors don't fit. So we need to work with wherever everyone's up to with their lives. We need automation to be reliable. And then of course, and I think some people have touched on this and it's gonna be spoken further about later, the health economics of this is really um, often something that doesn't get thought of till late in the picture and it really probably is something that has to be thought of when we're even designing the technology and thinking of how to create it and the equity of access is huge and I'm gonna let some of the experts talk on that. So with that, it takes a village to raise a child type um, and this area of diabetes technology has had many people involved, um, many people came before me, I hope there are many people coming after me and a lot of the fellows and students did all this hard work, so I thank them. I very much thank all the volunteer participants, their families, because it wouldn't have happened without them and the funding bodies, thank you. Thank you, Sybil, for that overview of technology and especially in a field where we consider closed-loop therapy as a strongly recommended management option according to various in consensus guidelines. So the next speaker is Professor Tim Jones. And Professor Tim Jones is a senior pediatric endocrinologist at Perth Children's Hospital, is a clinical professor at the University of Western Australia, the area director of research for the Western Australian Child and Adolescent Health Service and the co-director of the Rio Tinto Children's Diabetes Centre, JDRF's Global Centre of Excellence. He's internationally recognised for, for the clinical investigations and leadership in childhood diabetes. And may I also add that he has been my supervisor and mentor during all my research projects. And I think it's fair enough to acknowledge and say a thank you to him. And so his presentation title talk is Translation in the Real World. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and 
except for the senior bit. But, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so I, I'm going to talk about uh, translation in the real world. And until about an hour ago, I didn't know what Jeffrey was going to talk about. And what I'm, what I'm going to mention and, and go over is some of the aspects that, John, uh, that uh, Jeffrey's talked about, uh, some practical implications of it. Green button. So um, I'm going to talk about where we've been, where we, what we've learned, and what the challenges are for the future. Now, the theme of this uh, whole symposium has been the last decade. I'm going to go back three and a half decades to start with, because I think that shows the, the change in pace that's happened in the last decade. So this is, uh, this is the... This is going back to 1986. This is the average hemoglobin A1C of just about every child in Western Australia uh, over that time period. Our service looks after over 98% of children. Uh, and you can see uh, the change in A1C that's occurred over the years. Um, now you may think that the hemoglobin A1C was very high in this early, and indeed it was. And, but I think it's representative. I think the whole picture is kind of representative. Um, of uh, at least Australia and possibly other parts of the world. And if you think that was high, the, the mean hemoglobin A1C in the, diabetes, in the control group of the DCCT in the adolescents wasn't far off that. It was almost 10%. So it, 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 uh, it's astounding to think how high uh, 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 poor our glucose control was back then. We can't really look at hemoglobin A1C without looking at hypoglycemia, and, and this, this graph shows the severe hypoglycemia. It's actually more than severe hypoglycemia. This is coma and convulsions. Uh, severe hypoglycemia is defined as requiring assistance. That's a little more difficult to uh, apply in children because often they all require assistance because they're children. So we tended to focus on severe hypoglycemia. And if we put these two together, it, it really tells a story. Um, as a reminder, yesterday him, uh, we were doing urine tests up until the last part of the 1970s and the early 1980s. Um, home blood glucose monitoring came in in the, in the uh, early part of the um, 80s and was increased. And that uh, facilitated the DCCT, which came out in about, I think it was 1993. And you can see our hemoglobin IC starts to drop once we. Uh, learnt about the reasons for actually having to improve diabetes control. Um, intensified therapy was introduced. We changed our model of care. Uh, we included our nurses more, uh, and we really intensified what we did. Uh, and then a bit later on, we had pumps and MDI coming in. Uh, you can see what happened to severe hypoglycemia once we intensified therapy, much like the DCCT. Um, we were seeing 20% of our the children in our clinic having a convulsion uh, each year, which is an astounding high rate. Um, and that really, that severe hypoglycemia limited our ability to improve control further. You can see it sort of hovers around 8% for a number, number of years. Uh, but slowly, with analog insulins, increasing pumps and MDI use, and uh, education, more knowledge about hypoglycemia, severe hypoglycemia reduced. Uh, and you can see it gradually falls down there until the relationship between severe hypoglycemia and diabetes control really was lost um, 10, 15 years ago, at least in children, if not in adults. And more recently, we've seen CGM and HCL, and we're now seeing a further drop in uh, immulobin A1C and improvement in control. I think it's heading down towards 7%. So what have we learned from this? Um, Charlie Brown. If you don't know who Charlie Brown is, you should ask your grandparents, I think. Um, well, first of all, we've learned that research works. Um, the average uh, drop in the rate of uh, retinopathy progression, for example, and this is looking at the DCCT curve, it's, it's at least 10% of what it was. It's, it's, it's tenfold reduced. So what else have we learned? Well, we've learned that it took multiple interventions and uh, multiple approaches. Uh, models of care delivery were changed. Knowledge and education was increased. Uh, we changed our insulin delivery methods. Uh, we increased uh, glucose monitoring. Uh, and we changed glucose insulin therapies. It wasn't just one intervention, it was multiple. Um, 
we, uh, we, we have had a lot of interventions in mental health over the time. Um, we haven't used much uh, uh, adjunctive therapies. And you can see the pace is really accelerating. So what have we learned about translation? Well, it can be slow, and uh, there's often a delay before it's introduced in clinics. Um, we see multiple reasons for failure of translation, uh, and it's not been out without debate within ourselves, within our teams, and within our professional bodies. That's not a bad thing. Uh, we've learned to involve consumers. Early on, we didn't consult them at all. And we've learned that one size doesn't fit all. We've had to try and some therapies worked in some people and not in others, and some were more effective in some and not in others. Uh, and more recently, as uh, um, Sybil alluded to, equity of access has become uh, a challenge, especially as these new devices do cost. They're not always covered by the funders. This is an example of a study we did uh, 10 years ago, funded by JDRF. We, we uh, looked at the glucose suspend system for hyperglycemia, and we, um, we thought we, this was Mary, Mary led this, uh, well, Mary was part of this. Um, we included hyperglycemia prone people, which was unusual because usually they were excluded from trials, and we had clinical hyperglycemia as our outcome. And it was published in JAMA, we thought we were pretty smart about that. Um, we, got, we did an economic analysis afterwards, which showed it was cost effective. And then when we looked at the outcomes, uh, two or three years later, very few people were using it. So why was that? These are questions we need to ask about uh, um, our translation, our trials, and our devices, and uh, our new therapies. Was it clinician inertia? Was it a regulatory problem? Was it funding? Was it unacceptable to people with, that, with diabetes? Was it a staffing resource, resources issue? Uh, was it simply superseded by the time we actually got all the studies done? Or was there some other reason? I'm sure you might think of other reasons too. Um, and it's probably different in different jurisdictions. In the US, it was regulatory. The FDA would not approve a system that controlled insulin that was a machine. Of course, that's changed now. Um, in, uh, in Australia, I think it was simply because it was a new system in place. By the time we'd done all these studies, there was predictive low glucose suspend. So the low glucose suspend was not... So we were too slow. The system was too slow to actually allow it to be practised. So a little quiz here. When was the first iPhone released? No? Yes. <laughs> and what's the light most recent iPhone? Sybil, you know everything. You <laughs> spoiled it. And it just shows how fast. And what's the big feature of the recent iPhone? It's got a crash detector. If your car crashes, it will call an ambulance with your friends. It's also got uh, GPS. It's also got satellite phone in emergency. Anyway, it just shows how quickly technology moves. And this is a, a recent paper that argued that advancements in diabetes, diabetes technology is outpacing the evidence. Um, and this is a simplified schematic, and it is simplified. You develop the technology, you do the trials, you show it's safe, safe and efficacious. Um, you put it to the regulatory agency, uh, it gets approved, um, it goes to guideline decisions, the clinicians have to sort of approve its use and say it's effective, the funders have to fund it, whether it's the government or insurance companies, then the prescriber makes the decision, and this, this all takes time, there's a number of places in there that you can get a blockage. But I think they've left out the uh, per -per person with diabetes there too, because they make a decision whether they're going to use it or not. Um, so we do need to accelerate this, we need to look at the blockages, we need to look at how we can advance it. Uh, and also, the, again, as uh, we mentioned before, at the bottom now we need to make sure there's equitable access to this treatment if it works. So how can translation be accelerated? So one thing 
the we, we don't have control over much of those spots um, or blocks or, or procedures, but we do have control over the trials. Um, and uh, a recent uh, review in The Lancet uh, talking about accelerating clinical trials, time for turn words into action. This was, this was um, prompted by the uh, observation in COVID that we're able to get trials into place very quickly and got some very um, useful information out of those trials. And it seemed to be a faster process, but uh, the normal process of trials is very slow. So they're suggesting that um, we design trials with translation as a consideration. So that needs to be thought of when we're designing the trial. We also need to co-design with the people with diabetes because they're the ones that are, we're, we're going to be using it or being given to. Uh, reducing bureaucracy, obviously. I think someone from the, from the FDA that said streamlining and quality are not oppositional or opposed. Uh, we need meaningful primary outcomes, not convenient primary outcomes. This is that lamp. This is that lamplight uh, analogy. And we need to design with equity a consideration right from the start. We need to include uh, minorities and disadvantaged people in the trials right from the start and be thinking of the, um, how they can facilitate equitable um, translation. Equity of access is difficult uh, um, to achieve. It's a difficult problem when, when we see an individual in clinic, or a clinician sees an individual, we see factors that determine their outcomes and that are sort of highlighted in yellow, their age, duration of diabetes, family relationships, all those normal clinical things, but we don't see uh, a whole host of factors or determinants that sit behind them, uh, which are sort of shown on that slide. And I think uh, we should at least, or clinicians should at least be aware of those um, determinants, if not, um, try and uh, be part of uh, making them more um, clear to or trying to uh, mitigate them. And health disparities occur early um, in the course of type 1 diabetes. This is a study from uh, the Boston's Children's Hospital, quite a large number of youth, and they divided them up by race. And they found that within 9 to 12 months, there were significant differences in outcomes in those, uh, in those children, um, depending on their racial, uh, or of course race is a marker for many other um, social um, situations and disadvantages, but this was, this was how they divided them. Uh, we need to understand better what the drivers of this are so that they can be addressed. Is it just access to technology? It's probably a lot, lot more than that. Uh, and we need to un understand the cost for the individual of that, and also the cost for society of that, for not addressing that. I think it's where health economics comes in, or broader than health economics, just, just economics. Uh, this was, uh, you probably, the paediatricians in the room will be familiar with this uh, comparison of German outcomes and uh, US outcomes. The T1DX is obviously the, the uh, US outcomes, the DPV is the German outcomes, and um, increasing disadvantage which goes from right to left, uh, is associated with a higher haemoglobin R1C across all different five quintiles of uh, socioeconomic uh, status, both in, in the US and in, and in Germany. It's there, but not quite as marked. And it's either, we don't really know in Australia where this is the case. Um, they also found that, obviously, um, CGM decre use decreases with the increased disadvantage, so the the lower your socioeconomic status, the less CGM use you'll have. Not the case in Germany. Obviously a feature of their funding system. And pump use, so this means HCL use will be reduced depending on if, if you've got an increased social disadvantage. Um, obviously this is, a, this is a registry study, you can't link causality here, but it's, unless you postulate that your lower socioeconomic status means that HCL doesn't work, there has to be some link here. 
And this was uh, an interesting paper, a very recent paper that shows uh, where we should be going with, with our trials. This is a trial of uh, a particular type of um, HCL system and they recruited broadly from the, from the socioeconomic and racial groups. So they included minorities in their trial and they were able to look at that minority and they showed that they had just as, just as good a response to the system as, um, as people in more privileged uh, circumstances which really um, is uh, powerful ammunition to, to advocate for universal access to these systems. Um, and it does illustrate also that we do need to, when we're doing our trials, we do need to try and include uh, minorities, disadvantaged people, because very often we include more educated people in our trials. I think if we went back and looked at that, we'd find that uh, that was the case. So this is the uh, Bronfenbrenner uh, model. Uh, it was really devised to um, to, to um, describe childhood development in terms of four or five systems um, that the child sort of interacts with. And we've modified this for, for diabetes. Um, and it's very complicated. I'm not going to go through all the details. But it does, uh, a child with Childhood diabetes has family, exists in a community, and exists in a society, has interactions with um, uh, a wide group of individuals and, and organisations. Uh, and uh, research, research translation, clinical care has not always taken uh, this broad, broad view of a child um, and its outcomes. And if we're to be successful in improving outcomes, uh, at least in paediatrics, um, we're going to have to uh, appreciate this, this complexity. So what are the challenges? Um, there, there are unlimited challenges. I'm just put them down as questions. There's unlimited questions. Um, how do we effect, accelerate effective therapies into practice? This is still a major problem for us, and it's still something we need to address. How do we get that? pathway moving more quickly before the, what we've got is obsolete. Um, and how do we develop and implement new models of care? We've got new therapies, new approaches, uh, new challenges in, in funding. We really have to look at new models of care and, and how do we do that? We, don't, we haven't done it significantly over the last 50 years, but I think the future is going to uh, challenge us to, to look at our models of care to make them more efficient and uh, more equitable. Um, how do we exploit digital advances? We've got massive digital advances in the last 10 years. We really haven't utilised them in medicine, certainly not in diabetes care. And how do we do that? And how do we ensure we have access, all have access to new therapies? Uh, and how do we remove these disparities? Um, and how do we personalise care? Because not all therapies work for everybody equally. Uh, when we take a, when we just think everyone has an average response, um, we, we lose the details. Uh, and how do we move uh, clinical trials to improve their efficiency and really meaningfulness so that they can be um, accelerate translation? And finally, how do we encourage the next generation of researchers and innovators? Because the, the, uh, it's, it's getting increasingly difficult to um, encourage uh, people to, to move into research and innovation and to, to put things, uh, to, to move things forward. So capacity building is something that is a big challenge for all of us going forward. So they're my views of the challenges. I'm, I'm sure there's, I just ran out, of, ran out of places to put questions. It could have gone on and on and on. But uh, um, thank you for your attention. These, these are my acknowledgements. People in the Global Centre of Excellence and uh, people living with diabetes and of course our funders, so thank you. Thank you, Tim. And um, this really sets the stage, um, as he's highlighted the significant disparities in the glycemic outcomes for the next talk, which is by Professor Louise Maple Brown. Professor Louise Maple Brown is a senior adult endocrinologist at the Royal Darwin Hospital, Deputy Director, Research, and Senior Principal, 
Research Fellow at Menzies. Professor Brown has been providing clinical diabetes services to urban and remote communities in the Northern Territory for over 20 years. She's a current member of the NT Clinical Senate. And the title of the talk, Challenges of Type 1 Diabetes Care in the Disadvantaged and Remote Communities. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak today. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and also the Larrakia people of the Darwin region where I've had the privilege uh, to live and work for over 20 years. Uh, some of my talk today really is a bit of a clinician's perspective, uh, as some of this area is a bit of an evidence-free zone uh, and uh, relates to my experiences as an endocrinologist in the Northern Territory uh, for a couple of decades now. Uh, and what I've experienced over the years is really a heterogeneity in phenotypes of youth onset diabetes. Uh, particularly among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people. So today I'll be focusing my talk on uh, work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, young people. And uh, amongst that group, the classic type 1 diabetes is really quite rare. But more and more often now we're seeing what we call uh, youth onset type 2 diabetes. But really there is uh, a grey zone in between. Uh, the two types, and I'll talk a bit more about that today. Particularly in the young, under 15 years I'm talking here, um, we do often see uh, diabetes among lean children, but it's not classic type 1 in that they are antibody negative generally and they don't generally have diabetic ketoacidosis, but they do have a relatively low C-peptide and it would appear that they have a beta cell dysfunction as their primary uh, uh, physiological condition. Uh, really, the feature that is consistent across all these children is extreme poverty and disadvantage. Uh, this is quite an old photo now, but I distinctly remember this as my first uh, Aboriginal uh, patient with type 1 diabetes when she started on an insulin pump. I think this is at least 15 years ago now. Uh, but she does remind me of some of the complexities uh, of managing type 1 diabetes in the setting of disadvantage and also the heterogeneity of phenotypes uh, this young woman does have type 1 diabetes. She does come in with ketoacidosis, and uh, her sister also has type 1 diabetes, but I also see their mother, and she has very clear type 2 diabetes. Uh, so this young woman has also been on metformin as well as her insulin pump for some time, as she also has acanthosis nigricans and clear um, clinical signs of insulin resistance as well as type 1 diabetes. Uh, this really is uh, the, the typical youth onset type 2 diabetes that we see among uh, Aboriginal young people in the Northern Territory here. This young man is 25 now, was diagnosed at the age of 12 when he presented with high uh, glucose sim levels and symptoms related, had acanthosis nigricans, had a BMI clearly above uh, the 90th centile, negative antibodies, C-peptide in the normal range, very strong family history of type 2 diabetes. Unfortunately, at the age of 25, he now has end-stage kidney disease and is on dialysis. And unfortunately, this is not uh, an uncommon situation we are seeing with this uh, youth onset type 2 diabetes, a very rapidly progressing uh, kidney disease. But then this uh, young person is slightly different, a uh, 25 year old uh, woman now, diagnosed at the age 15, but was uh, BMI 23 at diagnosis, antibody negative at diagnosis and labelled as having type 2 diabetes with again a strong family history of type 2 diabetes uh, and treated with the, the usual type 2 diabetes medications, but then later, just a couple of years ago, now is GAD antibody positive and C-peptide at the lower, the lower level. And is this type 1.5? I don't know what we call this. As clinicians, we tend to call 
Most things that aren't clear type one, we tend to call type two, but actually really, uh, talking to Mark Cooper just before, type one and a quarter, he and I were talking about. Um, but we, we do see quite a few young people uh, that it's, it's really in between type one and type two. Um, but for this young person, as is the case with many of these young people, the social disadvantage is uh, the greatest challenge in the management. Uh, and just this third uh, young person, now 27, but diagnosed at the age of 17 during pregnancy, again, antibody negative and prescribed usual type 2 therapy outside of pregnancy, but then experienced ketoacidosis with the SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, and that was ceased after the ketoacidosis. Uh, but then on further investigation, has exocrine dysfunction of the pancreas without any history of pancreatitis or alcohol, uh, and then did very well with starting insulin and creon. Uh, and so potentially we also uh, are seeing quite a lot of uh, exocrine dysfunction of pancreas associated uh, with youth onset diabetes as well. So there's a broad spectrum of types of diabetes that we're seeing, and it's not all clear classic type one or two. Um, but we don't have a lot of evidence for me to talk to you. <laughs> this is uh, an example of a very early study that was led by Dr. Monique Stone, a paediatric endocrinologist in Darwin a little while ago. Uh, and this was a retrospective study of just people with diabetes who had come to Royal Darwin Hospital as inpatients or outpatients between 2007 and 2011, aged under 25 years. So you can see there at that time we had more young people with type 1 than type 2 diabetes. That's no longer the situation. We now have much more type 2. Um, but we d you can see there a, a small proportion of those with type 1 uh, did identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander at 17% but much higher for the group with type 2. 84% of those are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander young people. Uh, the better evidence we have is much more recent, led by Dr Angela Titmus, our only paediatric endocrinologist in the whole of the Northern Territory. Uh, and this was a key paper from her PhD that she's recently been awarded. Uh, this uh, was technically an audit of youth onset type 2 diabetes, but Again, that was by exclusion of not having completely classic type 1 diabetes. Some of those people in the grey zone between the types would be included uh, in this audit. Uh, and this audit had very robust methods in terms of using primary health care data from across the north. Uh, and Dr Avani Haynes, who's probably here in the audience, played a lead role uh, in this work, uh, along with Liz Davis and many other collaborators across the country. Um, and uh, this was the inclusion criteria. So under the age of 26 uh, and between the years of 2016 and 2017 was when this work was done. Uh, so the prevalence in that uh, study uh, was indeed very high and particularly in Central Australia uh, at 14.4 per thousand, uh, which to our knowledge is the highest that's been recently recorded reported uh, in the world and much, much higher than what we had previously reported in the Northern Territory or that is reported uh, Australia-wide. Um, and in relation to glycemia, we're very good at testing HbA1c. About 80% of the young people had had their HbA1c measured in that time period, but unfortunately only 14% met the target of 6.5% for HbA1c. So a lot of room for improvement there. Uh, I might skip over that. The BMI, though, is interesting for, uh, from this result, particularly for the young group under 15, as I was mentioning before, that's the group where the phenotype really is not typical uh, of either type 2 or type 1 and is somewhere in between. Uh, but particularly that young group, you can see that the proportion who's uh, living with a weight either in the normal or the overweight range really is relatively high for what you would think for type 2 diabetes. So this really does include that, include that group with an uh, unclear type potentially. But as I mentioned before, the consistent feature is uh, poverty and disadvantage. 
And I was recently involved uh, in a paper from yeah, a global perspective talking about the contribution of the social determinants of health. Uh, as Tim uh, pointed out very importantly in his talk as well. Uh, these social determinants really do play such a key role in driving inequities in diabetes. So food insecurity is incredibly common uh, among Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory, uh, as is poverty, uh, limited education and employment opportunities, structural racism and intergenerational trauma all play a key role in contributing to uh, disadvantage and reduced uh, or poor diabetes outcomes. So we see this cascade of widening inequity in diabetes, where on the, on the left, at the first, number one there, are the minoritised communities uh, experiencing disadvantage from the beginning. And then over time, on the x-axis, you have the contribution of the social determinants of health leading to that widening inequities and experience by minoritised communities in Australia and, and globally. So in the NT, just to give a setting for the, the context, 30% uh, of the Northern Territory population are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Our population is very small, it's only 200,000 total population of the Northern Territory. Uh, Aboriginal people in the NT are a younger age than the Australian population and, and the uh, non-Indigenous NT population. One in three Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory are 15 years or younger. 77% uh, of Aboriginal people in the NT live in remote or very remote locations. 23% uh, are outer regional, so the whole of the NT is outer regional or, or remote or very remote. The employment rate is only 37% and the year 12 completion rate for education is under 50% for Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory. Diabetes is the leading cause of death in both Aboriginal men and Aboriginal women in the Northern Territory. And there's significant heterogeneity in relation to uh, culture, socioeconomic status, language, ethnic admixture, body composition, body build, a, a very diverse population within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Northern Territory. The challenges in care have already been alluded to in other presentations, but particularly uh, it's challenging to access the full multidisciplinary team in remote Australia. Uh, where I work, it is very hard to access all members of the multidisciplinary team uh, across the Northern Territory. Accessing the latest technology is also challenging, as is accessing peer support when you live in a very dispersed and very small population. We also have extraordinarily high rates of staff turnover in remote primary care, greater than 150% per year. Uh, so primary care is uh, in great need of additional resourcing. So in that context, uh, I started and lead uh, Diabetes Across the Life Course Northern Australian Partnership and I'm a firm believer of the importance of partnership and collaboration in addressing some of these inequities. And the vision of our partnership is uh, to work in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, primary health care and community controlled health organisations to break the cycle of type 2 diabetes and related conditions. That's the picture of uh, a partnership with families and communities in the centre and the life course around the outside with key elements such as community engagement and capacity building uh, It's key parts of that circle there. Uh, Sian Graham on the left there is the chair of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advisory group of our partnership who play a critical role in advising on all of our work and ensuring that it meets uh, and that they define the priorities of the community. Oh, I, that was supposed to be removed. <laughs> um, don't have time for everything. Um, the, uh, the second paper that I just wanted to draw attention to that was recently published in The Lancet uh, was uh, a great honour in that they 
uh, highlighted our Diabetes Across the Life Course partnership as a global uh, case study in how to change the ecosystem in addressing inequities in diabetes. And so particularly highlighted our work with communi communities and partnering with health services uh, in trying to reduce disparities in diabetes outcomes. Uh, and a key part uh, of our work is a qualitative work, working closely with uh, people living with diabetes. And some of this work I'm just going to share relates to diabetes in pregnancy, but really the themes are consistent across all types of diabetes. And so some of these important enablers here reported by people living with diabetes in pregnancy. And so it's about connections with family and community. There is no me, it's we. The importance of the connection with land and culture is incredibly important to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And then pregnancy as a motivator was critical here for this time point. Other key supports during pregnancy are the importance of health professionals. Uh, the guys at the clinic, they were just amazing. They made it much easier than what probably would have been if I tried to struggle with it by myself. The importance of families, it was always nice to have mum there. And then the importance of social media as well is interesting. But then barriers, as I mentioned before, food insecurity is really the biggest uh, barrier we, we face, particularly when prescribing insulin uh, for people who unfortunately uh, cannot afford to buy food uh, for the full week. Um, and so some of these quotes here about if I have enough money, I can buy groceries, good, good food, but sometimes when I run out, so I just go out to the takeaway. The problem the women have in the community is if there's a, there isn't a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables, so it's easier to buy a takeaway. And then the lack of facilities, pools close a lot, they can't keep them open when there's no lifeguard. And then the competing priorities related to uh, family and other priorities. So a key aspect of our work is around co-designing to improve models of care, working closely with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people, families and communities. This work relates to what we call youth onset type 2 diabetes, but as I uh, mentioned earlier, it really is a spectrum across from type 1 to type 2 and really does include your all youth uh, with diabetes. Uh, and has four key elements there related to working closely with communities and health services, improving models of care. And just I wanted to end with some of the quality of work from the young Aboriginal people uh, that's been key for informing this youth onset work uh, for improving models of care. Firstly, that feeling of fear and shame. Before, I wouldn't want to like tell you my story at all because I was pretty much, at first, I was ashamed of it. And then the isolation. It's hard, you know, you think you're alone. Life is complex, so I've got two things, rheumatic heart and diabetes. And that's amazingly common clinically that kids have both rheumatic heart disease and youth onset diabetes. It's just another sick person in the family to take care of because it wasn't easy with mum taking her to the hospital for appointments or to the clinic all the time. And the shock of diagnosis, I thought just old people got it. I didn't know younger people get it as well. I didn't want to go back to the doctors after that. I just didn't want to listen. And then the normalisation shame paradox when diabetes is so common in communities. Everyone's got diabetes. It's not like, oh yeah, you need to make sure you look after yourself and cut down on those sweets. It's more like, yeah, everybody's got it, so what? I talk to my mum, I talk to my auntie too, I don't talk to anyone else. I felt like I was sort of a burden and you don't want your friends to be sad for you because you're sick. You just want them to treat you as a normal, not a sick person. These are all young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people under the age of 25 uh, reporting these feelings. So a lot of our work has been around sharing lived experiences to reduce isolation and reduce stigma. Uh, and uh, some of those videos there are uh, aimed at that. And we've had a recent social media campaign that has had a lot of um, contributions and a lot of attention from community, which is excellent. 
So I just wanted to finish with some recommendations uh, from a partnership, uh, and it's around prioritising initiatives to respond to social inequities that disproportionately impact Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people by focusing on three priority areas. Firstly, raising public and community awareness of youth onset diabetes. Secondly, addressing the social determinants of health and cross-sectoral collaboration is a key way to do that. And thirdly, access to high quality health care that's culturally safe and appropriate for communities and includes maintaining the Aboriginal workforce, which unfortunately is reducing in recent years. And prioritise strategies that engage and rebuild trust with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities through genuine partnerships, community-led programs, a holistic approach that I really prioritise as social and emotional well-being, and uh, as well as physical health and peer support, uh, including in schools uh, for youth type 2 diabetes, or all types of diabetes. So just to end, uh, the importance of incorporating Indigenous knowledge in diabetes research. I did this paper a couple of years ago with Sian Graham, who's the chair of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advisory group, as well as some collaborators in Canada with a similar partnership model. Uh, and really it outlines our ways of working uh, in high and promoting the voices of Aboriginal people uh, and incorporating Indigenous knowledge. I'd like to thank the PhD students, um, some of whose data I've presented today, but many of whom contribute enormously to our diabetes partnership and uh, the future. And uh, thank to all who contribute to our work, our funders, our clinical reference group and our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advisory group. And just to end on a positive, this is our Northern Territory Diabetes Summit last year in Alice Springs where uh, it was a strong cross-sectoral collaboration to discuss challenges and solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Louise, for that, um, for highlighting the heterogeneity of diabetes in the population, the ground sobering realities of diabetes in the community, and the work taken, undertaken essentially to overcome some of those barriers. So we'll move on to the next speaker. And um, we have Professor Joshua Burns with us. And Professor Burns is the Director, Center for Applied Health Economics, Griffith University. And the research experience centers around the design and analysis of studies for the purpose of measuring and demonstrating value in health. This is essentially on the background of um, our understanding that economic evaluations are essential to quantitatively assess the uh, cost effectiveness of a therapy when this is introduced into the community. So welcome, Joshua. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you. I must admit when I saw that I was on second day late in the afternoon, this is many more faces than I expected, I can tell you. <laughs> Uh, but hopefully um, we'll move through. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I guess I want to just kick off with first trying to get a bit of a sense of the importance of economics and priority setting. I think the glib response is simple. Uh, without economic evaluation, we don't sort of put forward a strong business case for funding. And without funding, we don't get access. And without access, we're not really being able to translate or achieve anything for patients. But if we step back from that and go, well, that's great, that's just a system thing, what's the underlying sort of theory? Well, at the end of the day, the bottom line is we just simply don't have the budget to permit all people in all circumstances to access all available healthcare and technologies. So we have to make difficult choices. So the goal of health economics then is to try and work out how can we maximise that benefit given that limited budget. It provides a systematic and quantitative approach to trying to make decisions under uncertainty with multiple alternatives. I guess as a health economist in terms of what drives us, because I think we're all here about improving patient lives and the quality of lives, from a health economics and as a health economist, it's about efficiency and opportunity cost 
which for health economists means the patient's not treated, the patient's not seen, the years of life lived in burden that could have otherwise been avoided. That's what we're here to achieve and overcome. So the starting point for health economics is resources are limited, not just financial, but also time and energy and human resources. We've got virtually an unlimited use of these resources. We can sort of deploy these in very many fields, but then even within our field, in terms of prevention, treatment, models of care, technologies, many, many different uses for them. So healthcare is an economic good. It's scarce relative to our wants. The flow of funding in Australia we have a mixed public-private system, which means we both have private funding, out of pocket from patients, private health insurance, as well as public funding. So state and commonwealth government funders. And we have mixed sort of providers of health care. So we have both state providers of health care as well as non-government. And the flows of money in and between these agents, as you can see, is quite complicated. Moreover, each one of these is a separate economic agent making their own decisions within their own context, maximising their own objectives. In Australia, and this comes from the JDRF report, which is wonderful, $2.9 billion annual cost across the society per year. And it was wonderful to see the Minister day one with this number on his lips. Fantastic. Really importantly, well, Only 19% of that burden is actually being picked up by the government. The rest is falling on patients and family. With all these different agents wearing different kind of costs, we have in the economic kind of context different perspectives. And each perspective is making a choice and a decision and they're facing different costs and limitations. So from a societal point of view, the 2.9 billion, we include it all, we really want to know the total. But from each of these agents, they're wearing different kind of costs and making different choices. For the patient and family, it's what their out-of-pocket cost is. What are they having to pay for? Plus their travel, absenteeism, presenteeism. So why aren't people turning up potentially, do not respond or do not attend to a very critical and important sort of attendances? Well, what are their costs? What is the decision that they're making? How is it being valued by themselves? From a public-private insurer, what do they cover? They set the rules, they reimburse what they determine. If it's covered, they'll include it, but if not, they'll exclude it. You know, we can think about these things very clearly in terms of patient experience. At a hospital, we don't pay for parking. You know, patients pay for parking. To what extent do we really care when we're asking patients to pay for parking, for example? And then from a provider, healthcare providers, they've got a different perspective altogether. So in terms of they get reimbursed for the services or technologies that they're providing, but the cost for them is the cost of production. So with all these multiple agents with multiple kind of objectives, it was really value and health that kind of try to herd the cats. How do we get all these different decision makers to come together to truly uh, motivate and be on the same page? And so for value and health, we really sort of put patient outcomes as the goal and the objective and maximising this relative to the costs associated with it. Indicators, processes are only valuable in and so much that they can affect health outcomes. HbA1c is great and better control is great, but what does it mean for a patient? Screening, fantastic, but screening alone doesn't mean a thing unless we can get to the end of this sort of paradigm here of health outcome and what does it mean for a patient. So in health economics, how do we measure and what's in the health outcome for economists? Well, we like summary total outcome measures of importance, which combines, well, the quantity of life, our survival, I think it was kind of talked about as stage five in the kind of idea of diabetes, this kind of quantity survival, as well as the quality of life, the quality of those years that were lived. In economics, we pick up kind of very standard kind of uh, what we call a patient reported outcome measure this one here is the most common, which is the EQ5D5L, which looks at quality of life on five domains, which is uh, mobility, ability to self-care, ability to untake usual activities, pain and discomfort, anxiety and uh, depression. This should be a flag already in terms of do we have the right tool here measuring quality of life? Sleep's not there. But when we are able to sort of put this into together, 
we're able to come up with our quality adjusted life years, which allows us to kind of compare across all diseases and across all technologies. And we're able to compare both in terms of improvements in quality of life as well as living longer. When it comes to our value for money, we're interested in margin. What's the incremental cost and the incremental benefit? And I think it was interesting when we see the discussions in terms of how these technologies are sort of competing for each other but also cooperating at the same stage. Not only when you sort of go into the decision are we sort of looking at, well, what's the marginal benefit of my technology, but it's also in terms of what that cost of that other technology is. So we're starting to bring in eyelids sort of uh, replacement at the back end, okay, the marginal benefit may be not so great, but what the cost, what's the cost there? And so how does that then transform in terms of our pump, pump technology versus daily, multiple daily injections, or even in terms of screening and how we sort of work together in the entirety? Because our outcome is a ratio, it means our result is going to be one of four things. Either in the top left-hand corner, Right, we're getting less effect if our origin is our comparator. We're going a left in terms of our x-axis, so we're less effective and we're more costly. So changing cost on our y-axis. So we should never do this. Pretty easy decision. In terms of the golden goose, we're all looking for interventions that are more effective and less costly. But in reality, that's not likely. So we have a cost effectiveness threshold in terms of where we determine the additional benefit to be relatively good value for money relative to the additional costs associated with it. What we have then is in terms of any sort of piece of evidence or, or what we have in terms of a technology, there's two ways to sort of increase your value. Either reduce your cost or increase your benefits. When we talk about increasing our benefits, we're increasing our claim for benefits. And in economics, we use models more often than not. So what's the change of a HbA1c in terms of the impact in terms of uh, complications subsequently, and then therefore impact on quality of life and survival? So we use economic models to extrapolate beyond trials to go into the future to start claiming some of those additional benefits that we think are associated with our technology. We're also able to link between those intermediate and final outcomes. But that comes with increasing uncertainty. The kind of typical models that we see in our outcome predictions and then adapted and used for economic evaluations, uh, the top one's prime, and I think the bottom one might be Cardiff model, but I'm not sure, are, are available. But in a recent review of these, there were significant limitations in these models. Many of them use UK PDS um, data for type 2 to plug in the gaps where we don't have data for type 1. There's limited accuracy already known in these models in terms of predicting outcomes greater than 10 years. We still have uncertainty with regards to our reliance on a surrogate outcome of mean HbA1c relative to variation in HbA1c, time in diagnosis, or even moving average. How good are we predicting these outcomes that we think are going to happen in 20 years? And if we're going to start claiming the benefit for that, how uncertain or certain are we about being able to achieve it? Also sort of limitations with regards to the insufficient inclusion of DKA the cog and cognitive impairment of hypo. And quality adjusted life years may be insufficiently capturing the fear and treatment burden. If we're not capturing it in our models, we're not demonstrating it, we're not measuring it, we're not able to include it in the equation. But a decision has to be made. So the problem then is one of uncertainty. And so uncertainty will always favour status quo. If we are uncertain about those benefits, we're more likely to delay. In terms of health economics, though, we kind of put this more into a framework of the golden triangle. Price, population, and time. We have to make a trade-off in one of those. If we're uncertain, drop the price. Get the cost down. We can increase our value proposition. We can be rewarded, if you like, for not taking on the risk associated with that uncertainty. If we're looking at population and the trade-off with population and price, we're looking at precision medicine. To what extent can we sort of justify a higher price by sort of putting into place treatments and therapies which are likely to have the most benefit for subgroups of the population? Smaller population, higher price. Or it's time, right? We have three-year trial data, five-year trial data. You wait. You want to have a high price to sort of claim those benefits of long-term outcomes? Wait 10 years, 15 years, 
decrease the uncertainty associated with the outcomes that you're claiming benefit for, but that will allow you to reserve your high price. So it becomes a trade-off in terms of technologies and how they move forward. This is another slide that I've stolen from the JDRF report and I think it's actually a really good one because it puts it, the opportunities in terms of economic benefits all in one. So we start looking at the far right hand side, we've got the total lifetime or the average lifetime cost for, the, for a patient diagnosed, for those with complications and those without complications. So when we start looking at technologies which are reducing and managing that complications, there's your benefit, moving from 738 738,000 average lifetime cost down to $143,000. When we start talking about preventions overall, we're talking about everybody at $400,000 average lifetime cost no longer being on the table. If we're looking at delays in treatments and therapies, we're pushing out some of these annual costs of therapy that we don't know or no longer have to, to have. At the same time, potentially not having DKA at presentation. Um, the last thing I'd like to just finish on is just that economists do have hearts. Uh, <laughs> and this is my daughter when she was, uh, had pump uh, installed uh, when we were at the walk, JDRF walk, and just a blurry image from the weekend playing soccer. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Josh. And we will move on to from adjusted quality of life to real quality of life. Um, and the next speaker is Professor Jane Spate. And Jane is a health psychologist who has specialised in diabetes for 25 years and is the foundation director of the Australian Centre for Behavioural Research in Diabetes. Her research interests focus broadly on understanding and reducing the psychosocial and behavioural burden of type 1 diabetes, its management, including the benefits and challenges of modern glycemic technologies and optimising support and self-care to improve both health and quality of life. Thank you, Jane. Thanks, Mary, and uh, good to see you all here uh, so late in the afternoon, as Josh said. Um, and thank you to JDRF for inviting me to give this talk. Um, here are my disclosures. So it's uh, quite apt that I'm following Josh, because a lot of what Josh was talking about, I and mean, indeed what we've been talking about for the last couple of days, has been health. Um, and I'd just like to make this very quick distinction um, it was actually first made by Hannah McGee uh, over 30 years ago now, uh, but it's uh, worth drawing attention to again today and on a continuing basis, I think. Health is not quality of life. The assumption that health is the only, or indeed the major, quality of life priority for people with diabetes appears unjustifiable. They are as concerned or more concerned in many instances about aspects of their lives other than health. And I think that is the reality that we're grappling with when we talk about the extent to which people are willing or able to use the treatments and technologies that we've been discussing here over the last couple of days. And so when uh, endocrinologists and educators and other health professionals are in clinic, uh, and focusing on health and talking about the technologies and the treatments and the screening for the complications and all of the other bits and pieces that absolutely must go into that consultation, it's really worth also bearing in mind the person's quality of life. The examples on the slide are literally just examples, but they're the kinds of things that really matter to people in their quality of life. It's, sorry, I don't know why this is moving on. Um, it's their working life, it's their family life, it's their friends and social occasions, it's pets, it's being able to drive somewhere, being independent, being able to do what they like, when they like, how they like. Uh, and it's this kind of freedom that people really value, both uh, freedom in their everyday lives, freedom to eat as they wish is really important as well. And it's these kind of freedoms that are actually taken away by type 1 diabetes. Uh, that spontaneity and that independence are really important to people and uh, they are crushed by severe hypoglycemia and the ongoing burdens of problematic hypos, impaired awareness, uh, and the list goes on in terms of the treatment uh, recommendations and everything that people have to do every day to manage this condition. And the 
other key part of this uh, slide is that image on the right-hand side. Life is now. People are not thinking about the complications that they may or may not get in 20 or 30 years' time. Actually, what they really care about is what's going on now, this week, this month, with their family, with their friends, with their work. And these are their priorities at the moment. And people discount future health and quality of life in favour of today's health and quality of life. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, I was fortunate to lead this paper that was published in Diabetic Medicine that explored what we've learnt over the last 25 years in the psychosocial aspects of diabetes in relation to the impact of diabetes on quality of life. And uh, I won't go into the details of this review paper, and you can access it. It's uh, free to access. Um, but what we talked about in there that was that diabetes, uh, sorry, is that quality of life is multidimensional. Uh, that's all of the dimensions that I've just talked about, the different aspects of life that people value. It's also subjective. What matters to me for my quality of life doesn't necessarily matter to you for your quality of life. You may have other aspects of life that are more important to you uh, than they would be to me. Um, it's also dynamic. It's changing over time. So what matters now may not be mattering in a month's time or a year's time, and these are all important factors. So all of this is what builds uh, up into someone's quality of life. And the challenge that we have in research is how do we capture that? How do we understand that in a reliable and valid way? Uh, and in, in order to use quantitative assessments in clinical trials and cohort studies and so on, we need um, assessments that are comprehensive of all of those things that I've just talked about. They also need to be easy to read and brief. So <laughs> it's not uh, a major challenge, but it's certainly a challenge. So I say all of that because that brings me on to what have we learned from the technology studies. Um, and I'll, before I go into any detail about what we've learned about specific aspects of life or, or the measures that we've used, um, there were some key learnings that have happened over the last decade around uh, insulin pumps, continuous glucose monitoring, um, SAPT, uh, hybrid closed loop. Um, who benefits? Mostly those people who have the capability, uh, the capacity and the opportunity to undertake demanding self-care. Because let's make no bones about this, using these types of technologies, they are not magic bullets. These require a lot of attention. They have a lot of cognitive burden associated with them. And while they're helping to improve health outcomes and they can improve some aspects of quality of life, they can also be quite burdensome for people. The psychosocial impacts of all technologies, I would say, are understudied and not capitalized on because we don't have enough funding going on in this aspect of research. We don't have uh, enough opportunities to be really assessing these outcomes uh, in all the studies that are going on. So I think this is uh, a global issue. It's not just an issue for Australia. Um, and, but what we do know is that these technologies can help to in increase people's confidence, their independence, their well-being. Um, but they also have uh, barriers to use and burdens for people in terms of being visible all the time, potentially. Uh, people being attached to them 24-7, not necessarily wanting to be, or for that being a problem when they go swimming or go to the shower or go to the beach and so on. Uh, body image issues and stigma as well that I'll come on to a little later. Use declines over time as well. So what we've learned from the studies is that the use of these technologies is strongly influenced by the person's experience of using them. So if they're not finding them particularly convenient or useful, um, or they're not able to integrate them into their daily lives, then at certain points they stop using them or they stop using them to their optimal effect. And our tendency in the healthcare area is to fault the person for this and to blame them for non-compliance, rather than seeking answers to the questions of how can we actually make these technologies better uh, and I know that there's been a lot of work going on, and we've talked about that a lot, a lot over the last couple of days, about how to make technologies and uh, treatments better for people, but we still do have this tendency to fault people for not using the, the treatments and the technologies that are actually available to them. 
So the onus is on us as uh, developers to create devices that people with diabetes actually want to use, as health professionals to support people with diabetes to identify the tools that are going to meet their needs, and as researchers to conduct holistic studies and as funders to support those holistic and behavioural studies. And on the right-hand side of this slide, I've also highlighted that all of the technology studies that have happened over the last decade or more, uh, so many of them differ in terms of the devices used, the study designs, the settings, the participants in those studies, and also the measures of quality of life and related outcomes that are used. So there's so much heterogeneity in these studies that it's very challenging to actually summarise it well. But last year, or actually this year, actually, I think it was in January that this paper was published uh, in the end. Um, we uh, published a paper in Diabetic Medicine referring to the impact of glycemic technologies on quality of life and related outcomes. Um, so it really did um, my uh, job for me today uh, to have already worked on this over the last couple of years. Um, in that paper, we um, show this uh, diagram, which really demonstrates the intersection and the challenges that we face in terms of technologies having benefits, barriers, and burdens. And a lot of the um, issues there are actually at the intersections. So some things can be both a benefit and a burden. Uh, for example, with sleep quality, um, the technologies can reduce hypoglycemia, which can improve sleep quality. They can also create alarms which reduce sleep quality. So there's lots of issues here that we can't necessarily say that these are a benefit or a burden. We have to ask the person how it's affecting them in their everyday life. So as I said, we published this paper uh, and it actually came out of um, an initiative uh, from uh, Collins' uh, group, the Diabetes uh, and Te Technology and Treatments uh, research group at Diabetes UK, um, where Ramsey, Arjun, and Pratik Chowdhury and Emma Wilmot uh, got together and decided that we needed a paper that would summarise the impact of technologies on quality of life and related outcomes, and they asked me to collaborate with them on this. And what I've put on the slide here is a very simplified version um, of the key findings of our review. Uh, and on the uh, in the column on the left, you can see the different types of measures that have been used in technology trials, and I've divided these into generic measures, diabetes-specific measures, and hypoglycemia-specific measures. If there isn't an arrow or some words, then the measure wasn't used or it doesn't exist. Um, and uh, what you can see here is that actually there were benefits across... Uh, several different domains uh, in terms of issues like reducing diabetes-specific distress and fear of hyperglycemia, improving general and diabetes-specific emotional well-being, improving diabetes-specific uh, self-efficacy or confidence in managing diabetes and confidence in managing hypos, uh, increasing treatment satisfaction and increasing sleep quality and also increasing uh, or improving diabetes-specific quality of life. Where you can see there are no changes is that it, uh, the technologies don't improve people's awareness of their symptoms of hyperglycemia. They don't appear to be uh, changing depression, so people with depression don't necessarily benefit uh, from these technologies, uh, or, or depression doesn't benefit from these technologies. And also, we don't see any changes in generic health status or generic quality of life. And that's a problem for the health economists to solve because, as Josh, Josh mentioned, um, you know, sleep isn't covered by the EQ5D. The EQ5D covers things like self-care, mobility, um, anxiety and depression. These are not issues that most people with type 1 diabetes have a major problem with. And so, so therefore, measures like the EQ5D are not picking up the benefits of these technologies. Now, moving on to our Australian hybrid closed-loop study, um, briefly, we asked people at the beginning of this uh, trial about their expectations of the technology, and then uh, after they'd been through um, the intervention arm, we asked them about their experiences. 
And what you can see is that expectations in terms of benefits uh, were very closely aligned to what people actually experienced in the end. But when we'd asked people about their expectations of difficulties, they didn't really come up with as many as they actually experienced. So what they actually experienced in terms of difficulties were adjustment to wearing the devices, but also interrupted sleep, alarms, calibrations, and technical failures um, that they hadn't anticipated. So these are issues that might stop someone from continuing to use such a device if these are ongoing and problematic. Now, the, the um, table on this slide is from our Australian hybrid closed loop trial run, uh, led by David O'Neill and Sybil McCauley and many other people, some of whom are in this room. Uh, and our work on this uh, involved Crystal Hendricks and Jennifer Halliday and our team. Uh, this table is very similar to the table I just showed you before, just for simplicity's sake, um, so that you can follow along. Uh, and what we showed here was that uh, hybrid closed loop was associated with um, reduction in fear of hyperglycemia, improved diabetes-specific positive emotional well-being, improved treatment satisfaction, although specifically that treatment satisfaction was related to perceptions of the effectiveness of the closed loop, not necessarily to the convenience of using it or to a lack of intrusiveness. And we also showed improvements in diabetes-specific quality of life. So what we learned from this study and others is that what we need to make a hybrid closed loop suitable for all people with diabetes who choose to use it is to manage expectations. Expectations are very high of technologies, um, but the experiences may not match those. And the hassles may influence long-term use. And hybrid closed loop, or certainly the iteration that we used in this trial, doesn't yet do everything for the person that they need it to do. We also found that those previously using multiple daily injections actually had better experiences than we might have expected, uh, that they're more likely to let hybrid closed loop run without intervening, without sort of tinkering with it, and they have no reference point for advanced technology, so they were very happy uh, largely with how it worked out for them. Uh, we do need to minimise our own biases, therefore, about who hybrid closed loop is suited to, and we need to keep listening to what people want we need to not expect the person to adapt to the system, but rather we need to keep working towards systems that are going to fit with people's lives. Moving on briefly to uh, what we've learned from uh, open source uh, artificial um, uh, pancreas systems and the real world impacts of those, um, I'm just going to take it as read that everyone in this room knows about open APS, uh, so I'm not going to be uh, going into detail about this, but it's been fascinating to see um, the extent to which uh, people can get time in range with these systems and how hard the, the algorithms are working in the background with the basal rates continuously adjusting to support people to achieve that time in range. And what we believe is that this is really absolutely showing the realities of the full-time job of type 1 diabetes self-management that hitherto, I think, has been uh, vastly underestimated um, by all of us. And this is an, uh, a paper that uh, came out um, analysing uh, tweets from people on social media, uh, sharing the benefits that they'd experienced with open APS uh, they found it astounding, an A1C of 5.4. They said, boring glucose is beautiful, um, and that this is amazing, great levels, and I'm not killing myself to get it. So Jasmine Ship in our group uh, recently completed her PhD looking at the experiences of people using open APS. And again, I've uh, simplified uh, the work that she did here in terms of a survey, which was a global um, survey of adults with type 1 diabetes, 451 were using open APS and 141 were using other technologies, a third of whom were actually using commercial um, automated insulin devices or SAPT. Um, so they were not uh, really, you know, very behind in terms of the technologies that they were using necessarily. Uh, and in this uh, study, we found um, uh, overwhelming uh, benefits experienced by people using open APS 
uh, in terms of uh, very similar outcomes to what I've described for the other studies. So reductions in diabetes distress uh, and fear of hyperglycemia, uh, improvements in general and diabetes-specific emotional well-being, treatment satisfaction, improved sleep quality here uh, with open APS that we didn't see previously um, in some of the studies, and improved diabetes-specific quality of life. And all of these effect sizes were medium to large, and the differences were adjust. Uh, the analysis was adjusted, so the differences are not due to gender, ethnicity, education, income level, type 1 diabetes duration, or recent HbA1c. So these do seem to be about the experience of using it, not the health outcome. Uh, almost finally, I just want to touch on stigma. There has been a couple of mentions of this over the last couple of days. Um, on the on, um, so this work has been done by Matthew Garza and our group uh, and several others in the US uh, with the Diatribe Foundation. Uh, we did a, st a survey of American adults with type 1 diabetes, almost 600 of them, uh, some of whom were using uh, various forms of technology and others were using um, the more basic MDI and self-monitoring of glucose. And what we found uh, using our validated diabetes stigma assessment scale was that of those using the more basic forms of diabetes management, 72% said that some people judge me if I eat sugary foods or drinks. That was the most endorsed item on that scale for this group. For those who were using a combination of CGM and insulin pumps, uh, we found that the most endorsed item was 70% saying some people make unfair assumptions about what I can and cannot do. So it's potentially the visibility of, those, of that technology that may be uh, influencing other people's perceptions of them and their capabilities. This questionnaire includes three subscales, and one of them is about identity concerns, so how I feel about being a person that's living with type 1 diabetes. Uh, and for those who were not using advanced technologies, almost half said that they feel embarrassed when they have to manage their type 1 diabetes in public, for example, checking glucose and so on. And it may well be, we don't know yet, the, uh, the evidence is not advanced enough for us to understand it, um, but it may well be that it's that kind of uh, embarrassment that's holding people back from using some technologies because they they would feel too embarrassed for other people to be seeing them using those technologies in public. For the people who are using CGM and insulin pumps, uh, around a third or just over a third feel embarrassed about what people might think if I need their help with a hypo. We don't really know exactly uh, why they may be thinking that. It's entirely possible that they may be feeling that because they've got all of this technology, everyone's expecting them to be able to avoid hypos altogether and that's clearly uh, not realistic. So we definitely have more work to do to explore the extent to which stigma may be affecting people's uptake of technologies and indeed the experience of uh, using their, those technologies in public and the, ex the social experiences that people may have. So we have several behavioral insights that we uh, need to realize the potential of type one tech. So currently, we judge technology largely on its ability to improve HbA1c, time in range, maybe severe hyperglycemia as well. We also need to value quality of life and the related benefits because these are important to people with diabetes and they influence continued and optimal use of the technologies. We currently treat technology as a mag magic bullet. Um, we don't have the resources or the systems to enable the required training and support for people with diabetes or the health professionals that are supporting them. We need to start treating technology as a complex behavioral intervention and support it accordingly. We currently treat technology as though it has a dose response. What we need to do is appreciate that most people with type 1 diabetes actually want to forget that they have type 1 diabetes. They don't want to be using it as much as possible. And many people are experiencing stigma um, around uh, the use of their technologies. Currently, we revere randomized controlled trials as the gold standard in evidence production, but we need to value all forms of evidence. 
That includes real-world evidence from cohort studies, qualitative studies, health economic studies, and so on. And we, need, we currently expect existing person reported outcome measures to be sensitive to the benefits of new technologies. Some of these measures have existed for 30 years. These technologies were developed in the last few years, yet we expect the, the problems to be able to do the job of being sensitive to them. So actually we do need to be valuing the design and development of new person reported outcome measures and we need to be embracing uh, methods like ecological momentary assessments, which are now enabling us to capture people's experiences in real time as they're using them. And I haven't had time today to go into what we're learning from the Hypo Resolve study in Europe, uh, where ecological momentary assessments are being used in conjunction with CGM to understand people's experiences and the impacts of hypoglycemia every day. So to conclude, we need to improve both health and quality of life for people with type 1 diabetes. And to do that, we need to appreciate both health and quality of life. And that both of those are influenced not only by clinical effectiveness of the technologies, but by the convenience, by the confidence people have in using them, by the customization of them, by the cosmetics of them, their appearance, and so on. Uh, by the costs of them, and also by the cognitive burden introduced by them. And around that, we also need to be valuing the opportunities to understand all of that in all of the research that we're doing, and we definitely need more work around the psychosocial and behavioural issues associated with technologies in type 1 diabetes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.